I think the first thing that hit me when we landed, because we went to Manchester, we didn't actually come um, to London, hit me was um, the snow and the fog. And when, you know, well, I mean, I, I saw my mum and dad for the first time because I hadn't seen my mum since I was, uh, you know, well, my dad actually hadn't seen me and, because he left just before I was born. The thing is, so when I saw them, fantastic. It was like me and my little sister, I was really sort of shy like this because, remember, we'd lived all my life with my grandmother in Jamaica. But when I came and I saw them, oh, it, it was just fantastic. But the thing that shocked me most was the weather. As I say, the fog, the snow, um, seeing a lot of white people that I've never seen, more or less a lot of them in my life. I know you experienced some racism at school. Wolverhampton was, yes, where my parents came here from the Windrush to live. Um, we settled in fairly well, but we went to um, a primary school, the primary school called Woodend Primary, fantastic school, I loved it. But when I started going to senior school, it was, it was really quite good. And I'm glad I went to a mixed school because then you got to learn about, you know, what I know now, the word diversity. <laughs> but we were well sort of like taught before we went in there from my parents heads up more or less, if I can say about what to expect, um, what sort of names, things people would probably call you, um, the food, all that sort of thing. So we were well prepared in a way, but the school was great. My teacher was the one who discovered my athletics ability, Barbara Richard, for my sport. And thank God for her, because she played a big part and still is a big part of my life. Um, yes, we did have like some racism that was in there that was quite hurtful. And I think that came from, you know, well, I'll tell you how I got in you know, the political way with the Enoch Powell thing and all this stuff was, that was going on. And I was spat on my uniform. I wasn't really much of a fighter. So my sister did a lot of that for me. <laughs> I hate you to that. She would have knocked him out, but she dragged him up by the collar and told me, you ever do that again? Because he actually spat on my uniform. Got called a lot of names. That was quite hurtful because at a young age, when you were you know, in school, you had white friends, you had black friends, it was quite hurtful. But because I had a strong shoulder, not literally, with my parents, my sister, um, close friends around me, I think I knew and know how to handle it well. You mentioned the Enoch Powell speech. Tell us what you remember from that or how and whether it impacted on your life, whether it was a live political thing going on around you. Ian Up Powell was someone who I really, if I can use the word detest, I really hated that man because although it was the latter part, uh, um, you know, that we learned and knew of him while we were in Wolverhampton because he did a lot of things in, um, if I remember rightly, Birmingham and places like that. I think he was the one who triggered off a lot of the skinheads, the name calling, the racism. He was so much against immigration of people coming. But I think, I think with him, he specifically hated black people. He was the man from hell. And people used to say, oh, Enoch will come and get you and, and things like that. You know, it was all, he was just not someone who was very nice. We felt, or I felt at the time, that he just wanted to get rid of black people. Do you remember the first time that you cast your vote? I can't actually remember, but I think I was eager at the age that we could vote. But I was a staunch Labour person, I hasten to add, and a staunch Labour person, I hasten to add, mainly because my whole family was Labour. <laughs> I mean, in that time, you know, my dad read the mirror. And if you went to try and go against anything like that, they'd probably have sort of puffed me into the next room and hid me because, um, you know, the whole family came that Labour was supportive and they knew what was going on in the country. They, they supported black people more than they felt that conservative or the other parties were in support of them. So I, I, I think I just, at the age of like 17 or, or something, 18, went and voted. And I was gladly doing that because the thing is, I, I, I'm one of these people who really believes that you should express your um, right and if you've got the opportunity to vote, you should go and vote. There's all sort of things that kicked into my political 
been. The things was for me when when first politics really rang home to me was when I was a little bit older and went to the 1976 Olympic Games. I don't know if one remembers then, but there was all that apartheid going on. That was another thing that was hitting us right, left and centre. And um, I remember it was in Montreal and we went to the, I was walking through the Olympic Village coming back from training. I'll never forget this. There was like two sportsmen, if we can say, just sitting on one of those big rocks they had somewhere in the village. And they were hugging each other and they were really crying their eyes out. And I thought, and people walking past and just like, you know, so I thought, what's going on? And then a minute I thought, well, they probably lost their competition and just a little bit sad from it. But I went up to them and asked them, you know, I said, what on, what, what's wrong? What's happening? And they said, we've got to go home tomorrow. The prime minister or, or whatever, the ministers have said, they've got to leave the village. I've got to go home because um, I, um, I think at the time New Zealand had toured South Africa and there was apartheid going on. So there was a whole call for the African countries and things like that to boycott. But um, that's when it really hit me at home first about real hard like politics and how this plays a part in sport. I couldn't understand that. But I felt so, honestly, I felt so awful for them because of all that hard work. And I think, why, why, why are they going home? It's their choice. But really, it wasn't their choice. Do you think that it still plays an aspect today in, in, in sport? I think politics has been going on since the year dot. You know, I mean, in 19... Maggie Thatcher, I met just before she came into power. From that time, I felt she was going to be a strong person. She was going to be a strong woman, a strong leader. But why I mention Maggie is because in 1980, when... And if I remember rightly, uh, the Russians invaded oh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yes, Maggie wanted us to pull out of the Olympic Games, but being called as hard head or what we are, athletes or sportsmen, we decided that Team GB would go ahead. And for me personally, I felt well. You know what? Maybe a bit was selfish. I thought, well, I trained all this time. It's really not really our our fight in the sense. And here we are, although we should be supportive if there's any bad things going on in other countries, but here we are, all this work and just to stop like that for someone else made the decision for you and not us making that decision. For a lot of people, if, we, if they hadn't gone, it would have been like, you know, it's their livelihood. How could they survive? And, and all this. So we made the decision to go. So politics, you know, kicked in there again uh, through Maggie. But in saying so, I have to say, not just about the politics kicked in there, I felt she was great. She was a really good step forward for women because politics did come into women competing. Did you yeah. ever vote for Margaret Thatcher? I didn't vote for Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> no. As again, I think I was still sort of more or less in Labour. The only, I have changed in three folds over the time because I voted for John Major. I voted for um, Tony Blair, you see, back again. And then the um, thing is, also, when there was this to-do with going on with Theresa May, I really was hoping that she would put foot forward. But I didn't vote for Margaret Thatcher. But I think it, it's not because I disliked her, as I say. I thought she was a good leader. I think I was just following the trade. Then, you know, to vote with my family when voting, and you felt like, oh, you'd be hung up if you didn't vote for Labour. <laughs> and I think at the time... Labour was doing a good thing, but it was nice that, I, you know, a woman had come forward because I, I suppose in my heart, I didn't regret that. But um, no, I didn't vote for her. So you voted for John Major. That would have been so that would have been in 92 when he first stood. And then you switched to Tony Blair yeah. when he first stood in 1997. So John Major yeah. might have been your first Conservative vote then. The reason why I, I did that is because I've always had this trend that, you know what, when people vote, or personally, when, when I feel people vote, they should vote because they should vote for people who think they can uh, um, do the job, people who feel that they can, um, people who you feel or I felt can, will tell the truth <laughs> for whatever that is in politics. And also, I think I'm a personality person. If I feel a person who's given off the right personality, who speak in the right language, as I felt for Major and Tony Blair, because I love Tony Blair, I really did. For whatever they say, I loved him. 
And I think, you know, for all the eloquent that came over for the way um, that, that you spoke strongly and, and, and for people who will get the job done, go out and act on what you're saying. And I felt that Blair gave that. And I felt and I, and I felt very much that um, Major gave that. And also, I have to say that John Major and Norma invited me to check us. And I went up. <laughs> I'm such a creep. <laughs> Let's, yeah, was let fantastic. me first ask you, it. before checkers, let me first ask you, is John Major the only Conservative leader you have supported? Yes. And was it, did you vote for him before or after he invited you to checkers? I voted for him before he went mm -hmm. into power. Yeah. Because um, I can't remember where we went to, but he came to an area. And do you know what? He even asked if I come up and I think it was supporting a lot of the sporting thing that was going on and that and there and I gradually went but I think I like the man as a person I liked what he was saying and I think he was a good PM. So John Major is the one conservative that you have felt not just able to but passionate about voting for. Yes, was I there did. something specific? Was it his background? He was, a, you know, from a very ordinary background. He grew up in, you know, very humble origins. Did you feel like you I had think, a connection? I think I felt he was very humble. I felt what he was saying. He was speaking truthfully. I felt he was, uh, he was talking to the people. I think that's what I look for in a, in a person and, and who is a politician. I, I felt that he wanted to do right for the country. I mean, good or bad if, he, if it came wrong afterwards. But to be honest, I felt he was an honest to goodness person. And I felt quite positive about John Major. I had no doubts in my mind uh, about John Major. And I think this is where I didn't feel disappointed about breaking rank at that time, mainly because in my heart, I felt that he was doing the right thing and he was saying the right thing. Tell us about going to Checkers. Oh, God, it was fabulous. It was the longest drive I ever had, Wayne going over there. So I don't remember where it is anymore. But when we went up to, to Checkers, it was just it was just lovely. I was really excited because I wanted to see what's on in this house. There was this big chest. There was all the medals and stuff laid out for, I don't know, like what there was a chief or PM things, whatever. On the wall, guess what? I didn't see a photograph. I'll never forget this. I didn't see a photograph of Edward Heath. Funny enough, I don't understand that. And, and I don't know what went on there. Maybe they didn't like each other or something like that, or Maggie occupied it after that. But, you know, because I don't think they liked each other. But um, it was a lovely place, lovely big room, little canopies and all them poshness to eat. Norma was just lovely. She was a lovely host, lovely guest. But it was, um, it was just an extraordinary place. But it was like you went in this great big like trophy room type of thing, just like mine, really. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some of your achievements. You won awards for the Javelin when you were in your teens. By the age of 20, you're an Olympic competitor. A few years later, you win an Olympic gold medal. The first British black woman to do so. The only British thrower ever to win a gold. It feels absolutely amazing. It's been 36 years this year. 37 years, I think, this year, yeah. It's just an amazing feeling because I wasn't the number one contender when I went out there um, because, of course, my, my other British rival was ranked um, second in the world, Tina Leela from Finland. She was like the angel of javelin throwing, beautiful, long, athletic, and, you know, threw the world record. But before even that, it was a tough time for me because... During up, up to those games, yes, I'd won, you know, a Commonwealth Games, gold medal and blah, blah, blah. But the Olympics, that was my 12th year training. Even my coach um, during the years I looked at in times, I had to go and live at his home, at his family for like two, three years till I got settled in, Le in Leeds. I'd worked my butt off every year up to that games because I had no sponsorship. I had to beg the people that I work for for time out to just so I could go and train. My family was still pushing steel in a factory and working hard in order to help me, even though I was moving from pillow to post. But that was a moment of winning that I will never, ever forget. It was first round, first throw. And I'd come back from injuries. I just didn't want to miss that for anything. I remember going down, walking down, and everybody shouting, 
come on, Tesla, come on, Fatima, come on, Sharon Gibson, because there were three of us in there. And all I wanted to do and thought about when I picked that javelin up for the first throw, I remember closing my eyes and just said, please, God, let it be right. And I've forgotten all about my injury, all about the leg being sort of bombed out, shattered. My arm broke before I came back in in 81, 82. And all I wanted was just to make it technique perfection. And that's exactly what happened. The javelin was lined up in a fantastic position that the way my coach has always taught me, Will Page, God rest his soul, he's passed now. And I came up and once that javelin was released, the feeling of my whole body into the throw, the lay, the perfection of the javelin near my eye, the point, it was amazing. Yes, it was amazing. It, it's obviously you have great pride in, in, in winning that gold. Yes. Of course you do. And you won it for Britain. And obviously it was a proud moment for our country when you won that gold. It's always a proud moment for our country when someone wins a gold. This has been, the last 12 months has seen the birth of the Black Lives Matter movement. Yes. It's been a long time coming, isn't it? hasn't it? It's been a tremendously long time coming. And I'm surprised it's not been here before. The thing is, it's important that people supported that. And, you know, me in particular, I really supported that because there's a lot of people, white people hasten to add, and especially some of those are in people in America from what was happening there, feel that, you know, black people are still unequal. And that's not so. And this had to happen because there's a lot more, I feel, only look at diversity in the boardroom, um, on the sporting grounds, what has happened, a lot of black people who have made their mark in this country and abroad, well-educated people, don't get the positions to do these things. So you see, it's right to stand up because we have producers now, we have filmmakers, we have, and, and even from the Windrush days, we had nurses, we had people who had done their job and people who need to be recognized for doing all these things. And Black History Month, we have as well. And I remember doing so much for Black History Month. I've never had so many schools write to me to say, can you please help us motivate, try and teach people about how Black Lives Matters, about from the early times, how the slavery day has come, coming out of that. What is it? The Mary Seacoles, the Lord Pitt, the us, you know, that makes things right. We matter. Black Lives Does Matter. And now when you look at things like in football, especially, what is going on? Absolute disgraceful. Because when you look at the amount of sportsmen and black sportsmen who have made up teams and not just sports now, remember, in teachers, in all this education, but sport is a big thing to the average person and for the child and the community to go and play sport. And you have people doing those things and doing all these terrible signs, throwing bananas on the field and this and that to some of these footballers. It's appalling. And now when you come further still into the boardrooms, there should be a lot more black people. I was the first female black, female person ever to occupy that sport, vice chair for Sport England until 2004 for three years. And black or white, female, you know, it's not there. Why not? Is taking the knee an important act of solidarity in your view? Is it an important symbol of solidarity? Yes, I do. I, I think it's I think it's a very important symbol because I think in some stages that's you know the only way people will learn. Stand up and be counted. Again, maybe a lot of us, us black people, need to push ourselves forward a little bit more. So you're in the presence to say yes. We are good enough. We want it. We want the opportunity. We want the fairness, you know, and we're prepared to put ourselves forward. I'm, you know, the same for me. There's a lot of things that I would have loved to do. There's a lot of opportunities, maybe in this sort of job work, media field and creativity, you know, but given the opportunity, be seen, be called up to do this. We don't know this until you're given the chance. There's a lot of youngsters out there as well who need to be educated that. Being born black isn't a disgrace, isn't a, something that you should be ashamed of. Be proud of your colour. Um, you go to school, you educate like everyone else, learn like everyone else. And if you, are, if you are clever enough and if you are 
if you have the degree and you can lead, go ahead and lead. Put forward. Keir Starmer, do you reckon he'll be getting your vote next time? I'm out on the shelf at the moment. I'm waiting to see what happens because although, you know, yeah, like I said, for the rules that I go on, you've got to know whether you can do the job, do all these things and then act on it. I mean, Boris, so far the vaccine and, and the Brexit and whatever is happening, and he was fantastic for the Olympics. I support him for that, you know, yeah. because um, I was an ambassador for that, did great for that. But um, I think I'm out on the fence at the moment and I'm watching and seeing what goes on. Did you vote for uh, Boris last time? I worked with Boris on the Olympics. Fair enough. Fair <laughs> I enough. worked with him on the Olympics. <laughs> And I still think Boris, whatever happens, I would have gladly done that again and worked with Boris for the Olympics on the legacy. Okay. But whether this happens now, I don't know. 